<laughs> well, hello. So, living free of dementia. Solving the puzzle to live free of fatigue, concussion, and brain fog. So, people ask, who's Dr. Gerhardt? Some mornings I ask that myself. And then I look at my jacket and it tells me who I am. Uh, there's different letters after my name and some people are curious. To me, it means I'm committed to lifelong learning. And the word doctor in Latin, and some of you have been here before, what does the word doctor in Latin mean? Teacher. It means teacher. And perhaps the most important thing I do is teach. So if I want to learn something, I teach. In fact, a critical part of me, my learning is teaching. And then if I really, really want to learn something, I write a book about it. And so those are the first three. So is this really true? Memory loss ahead. As we get older, we're going to lose it. Does that have to happen? No. no. Good. We can live free of dementia. And the most recent book, book number four, is focused on just that. Uh, as a team in the clinic, we see it time and time again. And I want to say thank you for Lisa, Alice, Cassie, and wherever my cow is. <laughs> Without my team, we wouldn't be making a difference helping people. So memory and healthy brain function can be improved <clears throat> if we solve the puzzle. There isn't a quick fix. And second, we do the work of TLC. Does anybody know what TLC is? Tender loving care. Tender loving care for your brain and body. Uh, in the research, it's called therapeutic lifestyle change. So it means changing our lifestyle to fit our unique needs. So dementia is deadly. 123% increase in deaths from dementia. One in two Americans over age 85 will be diagnosed with, with Alzheimer's type dementia. If 15% is an epidemic, what's 50? By the way, that's the fastest growing age group in America. That's my mother. We have an epidemic of neurodegenerative disease. Alzheimer's is the most common, but not the only one, making it the fastest growing cause of death in America. And there's no effective medical treatment. That means there isn't a drug and there's not a surgery or procedure, and probably won't be one, and you'll learn more, because it isn't as simple as a simple take a pill. Tonight we're gonna to learn what causes fatigue and brain fog, which contribute to dementia. Who's had a concussion? And I would suggest about everybody in this room has, but may not realize, and we'll learn about that. Why concussions matter, and what do you need for high-level wellness for life? So, <clears throat> what is fatigue? Anybody felt like that? It's like somebody unplugged me. Low energy, overtired, drained. Life is hard. It's like wading through quicksand when we're like this. What about brain fog? Anybody heard that term? My head's in a fog. I can't focus, concentrate. Memory's not working. I can't think straight. What is concussion? Concussion is any injury that results in temporary loss of brain function. You do not need to be knocked unconscious. The most important thing is that concussion from 20 years ago can affect us now, even 30 years from now. So it's a jolt to the body or brain that changes function. That little fender bender, I wasn't hurt, but I'm kind of irritable, I'm off. The next day I'm just a little spacey, I didn't sleep right. That is, that's one form of concussion a fall in which we didn't hit our head. You can land on your tailbone and have a concussion. You can be a soldier 100 yards from a blast. The blast wave hits your vest, compresses, creating a hydraulic shock. Going up, the brain's bounced around and you have concussion. That's what concussion looks like. You notice this, the University of California's Neuroscience Research Department did a brain model the consistency of actual brain tissue. It's kind of like jello. Do you notice he's not striking the head very hard? It doesn't take much to jolt our brain around. Our brain is very soft and that hard bony case has sharp ridges on the inside. And so there's many ways for the brain to be hurt. What's interesting is you can have a small fender bender, you know, like in pool, the cue ball hits the next ball, 
like that, that's what hurts us, that sudden acceleration or deceleration. So you can have a bigger accident in which the cars crumble, less injury, and those small ones can hurt us too. What are the symptoms? Classic brain fog, fatigue, I'm tired, anxiety, I'm irritable, I'm out of sorts. My memory is off, my balance is off, that's a very important one. And the effects can cascade in the brain and show up, the research says, up to 30 years later. I have a documented case of somebody, their problem showed up 40 years after two major accidents. Now the interesting thing is, concussion activates inflammation. Anybody heard of chronic inflammation? The major issue behind virtually all of our diseases of aging. The first concussion increases the risk of a second by 150%. The lady I discussed that her concussion showed up 40 years later, she had had a bad accident, and then 10 days later, she went off the road and hit, hit a tree. She shouldn't have been driving. Her balance coordination was off, and she didn't realize it because she wasn't aware of that. The second concussion increases the risk of a third by 300%. So this is a big deal. Concussion activates inflammation. Inflammation is the greatest enemy of our brain. When we talk about Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, MS, um, ALS, Lou Gehrig's, and the list, behind virtually all of this is too much inflammation. The brain is on fire. What's that called on the side? Uh, I'm from Minnesota and we have rust in the wintertime, and it would do things to my car so that I had to be careful with the, the latch or it would break off. I had rust all the way around it. Rust on the side of a car is what fire does inside your brain. In our brain, the yellow nerves turn on inflammation, and they turn on our stress response. The green nerves dial down inflammation, and so what concussion and many other things do is it turns on the stress response. That is ideal for minutes, but it can't last. If it does, we have trouble. Then the list starts. And, and I see people, when people come to me, I'm a holistic doctor because people come to me with a whole long list of problems. <laughs> and that list is pretty common. Pain, what causes most pain? The I word. Yeah, inflammation, good. Chronic fatigue, inflammation. I'm gonna show you another part of that. Brain fog, sleep problems, and the list. So, concussions matter. They increase, increase the risk of suicide. Up to half of all people who are homeless have had multiple concussions. Uh, they make children loners and hurt their social skills. Concussions create the same effect in the brain as Alzheimer's very quickly. And the brain can recover or not. If it doesn't, it increases the risk of Alzheimer's. The changes in the brain after concussion look just like those of dementia. Uh, Doug was, uh, and I changed his name in just a few details, one of our patients, he was, ran a successful business, and he had played football and had, you know, his fender benders and car wrecks. And then he was driving, uh, getting on the freeway, and his cell phone fell off the seat onto the floorboard. So while on the on-ramp, he reached down to get it. And as he reached down, he did this, and then he went off the edge and corrected like that, and his head went bang off the side window. Rang his bell. Was he knocked unconscious? No. Rang his bell. He didn't feel quite right after. <clears throat> he couldn't think straight. What's that called? Brain fog. His head's in a fog. Headaches. Upper back pain. He had a, a, a whiplash injury to his neck on top of it. He had a hard time reading. His occupation involved reading. Irritable, fatigued, his business went into a, a nosedive, and his marriage was in trouble. Why? When you've had a concussion, you're irritable, you're out of sorts, you're so cantankerous, grouchy, you can't live with yourself, much less anybody else. That's what his brain scan looked like. That's from behind. Normal is gray, there should be no reds in there. That's the side view, his eyes are up here. This is the part of the brain, parietal lobe, it has to do with reading and many other things, and it was in trouble. Another part of his brain scan we measured is his probability of traumatic brain injury. That's another word sometimes synonymous with concussion. What's his probability? 99.5%. He's right at the, at the peak. Severity? 
right on the edge of moderate severe. And so that's one tool that we use to measure if somebody's had concussion. We can also, that goes back to normal when treatment is effective. <clears throat> what did we do? We listened. The first thing a doctor has to do is listen to understand what's going on, what people want, what's important. Listening to the person living in their body is really important. I've learned that. Foundation visit, we put together the puzzle of why. That's like an in-depth history. We do a symptom root cause diagram. The top half is all of their symptoms. The bottom half is the roots, roots from North Dakota, kind of why we think it's happening. We reviewed the testing and exam results. We've heard of leaky gut, and I'll show you a picture. He had leaky brain as well. Delayed hidden food allergies. Did you know foods can light your brain on fire? Sometimes. Excessive inflammation, low vitamin D. Who knows their vitamin D blood level? It regulates inflammation, really important. Essential fatty acids, omega-3s, we're gonna talk about that. He wasn't making energy well, and he had balance problems. Increased risk of falling. Was he safe to drive? Not really. So we call it solving the puzzle, doing one thing. It's kind of like a recipe with eight ingredients. Imagine trying to bake your fa favorite recipe with one ingredient or two. People ask me which is most important. I would suggest the one, or plural, the ones you're missing. Piece number one is energy. Let's talk about that. What does our brain need to work well? You can guess. Energy, energy, energy. Where do we make energy? Anybody seen these before? That is a graphic of the mitochondria. We are as healthy as our mitochondria. When they work right, they make lots of energy and very few free radicals. These are the engines or factories inside every cell of our body. In a brain cell, which is microscopic, how many do you think are packed in there? Up to 10,000. Can use up about 40% of the cell volume. When they don't work right, instead of energy, what are we making? Free radicals. Guess what they create? The I word. One of your takeaways tonight is if you want to be healthy, manage the I word. Inflammation. Free radicals fire inflammation. So that's what healthy is like. Do you, can you see the effect of too much inflammation? That doesn't happen overnight. That's over years. Now concussions accelerate that, uh, of course. Can you see how they've lost brain volume on the outside? But inside, these big holes, that's parts of the brain are just gone. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Who's affected by that? We've heard of professional football players. The one study, 116 out of 117 pro football players who donated their brain on autopsy had CTE. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy is the result of repeated head traumas. The research is now telling us that a thousand little blows will create that without ever having a concussion. It's those impacts, like the linemen, those big guys that keep hitting repeatedly. Uh, so our concussions add up, and that changes our brain. Inflammation is the major cause of virtually all of our chronic disease, including dementia. There are triggers. A trigger is what starts this process. And then there's something called NF-kappa B. That's the master switch. When that switch is on, inflammation, like a gas fireplace, fires on, except it's in your brain. That turns on genetic switches that turn on a bunch of switches. And, and these, when we use Advil, when we use Tylenol, uh, Celebrex, these kinds of, we're, act, we're affecting different parts down here. And then it creates trouble, like inflammation, pain, insulin resistance. Insulin resistance creates type 3 diabetes, and that's strongly linked to what disease? Alzheimer's, sometimes called diabetes of the brain. One of the best things you can do to keep your brain happy is keep your blood sugar and insulin happy. And, and I'll have a slide on that later. So what are some of the triggers? Stress. Now stress is, just, is not just my wife hitting me over the head with a frying pan because she's upset. Not that I haven't deserved it, but uh, uh, she's patient. Uh, leaky gut, but stress is also internal. If we have chronic pain, if we have gut problems, if we have 
um, a sprained ankle that's never been healed properly. They can all contribute to internal stress if we don't sleep. Leaky gut, infection, allergens, sugar. Sugar is like pouring gasoline on the fire of inflammation. And we're going to talk about bad fats, talked about poor sleep, and injury, concussion is important. So remember our mitochondria? What can help turn off inflammation? Anybody recognize that? It's called photobiomodulation. It's one of the most researched of our therapies. It means using photons of light to modulate or balance. And it, we can actually turn off inflammation, and it's been shown to reverse inflammation in the brain and brain degeneration. What's amazing to me, the laser dials, almost switches off NF-kappa B. But remember, we need some inflammation. What does inflammation do that's good for us? It helps us with infection and break down old parts so we can replace them. So we need some. Think of it as a fireplace. Uh, you have a fireplace in the kitchen of an old farmhouse. You need a fire. But if, you, if the fire gets too big, what happens? Then you burn the farmhouse down. So we need some, not too much. So photobiomodulation balances that uh, inflammation. It dials down the genes. It turns off the switches. Something else that does it is down here. Anybody heard of vagal stimulation, the vagus nerve? We'll talk more about that. Vagus stimulation also reduces that inflammation switch. Wellness is balance. That's what we're looking for, not too much. What amazes me, and I document in the fourth book, and in the research for the book, I was just, I was shocked. Photobiomodulation, also known as the low-level laser, healing lasers, we're not talking lasers that cut steel. We're talking uh, health-promoting lasers that are completely painless and create no heat. They reverse every phase of the Alzheimer's neurodegenerative process. That's amazing stuff. Not only that, the research is clear. When we've done, in clinically, about six of these treatment sessions, it protects the brain against injury, against concussion, against stroke. We protect the brain when we do this stuff. This, these are powerful therapies. Uh, that's what one of the therapy units look like, and yes, there's a version for dogs. And I treat our dogs, and I'm guessing some people uh, in here love dogs. This is awesome with dogs. Uh, that's me using it. I'm treating the prefrontal cortex, first brain, and what am I treating here? Second brain, and we'll talk about that. And then that is a home unit, and I use that daily, called the V-Lite. It's an inexpensive home laser, and when you're treating in the nose, you're treating the capillaries through which your bloodstream flows completely every five minutes. So in a 25-minute treatment, I've treated my entire blood supply five times. That affects the whole body. That is an awesome therapy. List price on that. We don't sell them. We refer people to the site. Uh, with the di uh, discount code, is 360 bucks. That's an investment in brain health. And you can use that to treat other locations as well. Did, did you know that infection in your mouth can create heart disease and also amyloid uh, beta and leaky blood-brain barrier? That an infection in the mouth or sinuses, chronic infection, increases the risk of dementia. Anybody want to answer why? Why would infection, by, and I'm not talking about you're on fire with infection, you have a fever of 103. I'm talking about chronic low-grade infection you may not be aware of. It's a simmering fire. What does it do? What does it increase? Infection is a trigger for the I word. Very good. Inflammation. You're making me feel good as a teacher. Thank you. <laughs> That's our newest antibacterial antimicrobial. That means viruses and yeast and other things. That's a laser that is really nice for treating infection. I've been using lasers in, in the, uh, clinically since 2002. And I have, a, some people collect stamps or coins, I collect lasers. <laughs> My wife calls them expensive toys. I can tell you I've never used a laser like this uh, before. Combines the uh, violet 405 nanometer with the red 635. And there's a synergy in that combination. Remarkable. This is one of the tools that is bad for bacteria and viruses and biofilms, but safe for humans. So we use that with chronic infection. Uh, you can use it with the teeth, 
nail infections, use of gut infections, brain infections, that's a big one, sinus infections as well. And then we all often use biocidin, which is another biofilm disruptor. It's a synergistic blend of 17 different herbs and essential oils. And it's been around 30 years. It's the most effective I've ever used in that category. So what about COVID-19? Anybody heard of that? That means CO is coronavirus. Uh, and by the way, that's one, one version creates the common cold. Coronavirus, infectious disease number 19. First thing to keep in mind is 80.9% of these infections are mild. 13.8% severe, that's significant, and 4.7% critical. Death rate, 2.3%, uh, which is significant because the flu is what? 0.1%. This is 20 times uh, more of an issue. 14.8% over age 80, though, for a death rate. And by the way, it drops down to 0.4% for those under 40. Why is it that some people get really sick and even die, and many people don't? It's mild. Their immune system. Their immune system, yes. Are we hearing about that? If you're dealing with something like this, what do you want to take care of? Your immune system. Remember SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome? That had a fatality rate of 10%. That's almost five times higher than, than our uh, COVID-19. So we've been through things worse. Flu fatality rate, as I mentioned, is just 0.1%. So the real issue is keep your immune system strong. At the end of the presentation, I added three slides. And so if you like our slides, there's a sign up and we'll send them to you. I did three slides of all of our immune protocols things you can do to keep your immune system strong. That's not my presentation tonight, but I, I added that in. So the next question is, we're talking about brain health. How's my brain? Would you like to know? Some people know, I get it. Uh, it's been said that the longest river in Africa is, is not denial. <laughs> and for men, we tend to practice denial a bit. Stick our heads in the sand and I won't worry about it. Does that help regarding brain health? When we have these symptoms, they're a sign our brain is likely suffering. And this includes kids with ADD, ADHD. That increases risk of dementia later in life. That's a big deal. We want to help these kids. We don't want to give them medications that affect their brain development and are not safe in a developing brain. Uh, we talked about our brain, brain fog. But the most interesting thing is your brain can be degenerating going down the Alzheimer's slope with no symptoms until very late. The brain can compensate. Earliest signs for many. Depression. Feels like it's cloudy outside even when it's sunny. Anxiety that goes with it. Poor stress tolerance. I'm not enjoying life. Brain fatigue. I can't focus as long as I used to. I can't drive as long as I used to. Declining memory. Digestive problems, we don't think of that. Chronic constipation is commonly associated with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and these kinds of neurodegenerative processes. But years before you get the diagnosis from the doctor. These symptoms can show up 10, 20 years before. And it's much easier to help this stuff early. People tell me, uh, I have GERD. They don't realize GERD can be from their brain going downhill. Uh, it can also be other things. It's like eating the wrong foods multiple food sensitivities, swallowing problems, dry mouth. That's another common one when the brain's going downhill. Is my brain suffering? So there's different ways of measuring. When you're at home, a simple way regarding balance, because balance is it predicts brain function. Bad balance equals uh, bad brain health. You stand with one foot in front of the other, like you're walking uh, on, a, on a tightrope, and do this, have somebody spot you. Do not do this after half a bottle of wine, uh, and then you close your eyes, and you should stay really solid for at least 10 seconds. And if you're not able to do that, something's, uh, something's not right. Another one that we do is the neurologic pass pointing, and this is a variation of Romberg's where you go like this, eyes closed. But with this one, you put your index above your head, and let's do this together. Put your left hand on top of your head, and I mirror, I'm doing the mirror opposite. Left hand above your head, and then with your eyes closed, bring the opposite index finger tip to tip to touch. 
Good. Okay? Now, uh, go ahead and open your eyes and look at it. So the first thing is, this is normal. Normal is tip to tip, like the space station docking. That would be mild, that's moderate, and that's severe. Now remember that, because we're going to show you an exercise for what nerve? Starts with V? Vegas. The vagus. To start changing that, and we'll see how it improves. Balance testing, the better your balance, the better your ability to think. Poor balance is linked to dementia. But the other thing is poor balance increases risk of what? Falling. Top cause of serious injury over age 50 is falling. And if you fall and you create a concussion, what does that do? It makes it even worse. Now we accelerate, we get a snowball effect on the brain going downhill. Balance is really important. Neurocognitive assessment. We can measure memory against what's normal. We can measure brain processing speed. This tells me if somebody's safe to drive. This person would not be safe to drive. Normal is in the bright green. At least in the, this would be like an A or B in school. This would be a C to a C minus. And this would be failing. Any, even one X in the bright colors is trouble. That's a big deal. What makes my day is when we see people improve. People that go from here to all greens. And one of the examples in the class I teach, a lady with Alzheimer's, vascular dementia, the worst type, uh, and Parkinson's, all three. She went from at least that bad, she's all up here now. And I'm two years into the care process, she's still there. She fell off the wagon before uh, Christmas for a month. You know, the tremor came back. We did her brain balance stuff, the tremor's gone. She was in yesterday. And her neurologist said, I think I may have misdiagnosed your Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. She said, you have no symptoms right now. But we didn't cure it. We are managing to keep her brain healthy. Remember, wellness is balance. And she was like that. So we have to add enough good stuff, remove enough bad stuff to shift it. But if you start eating garbage and stressed and don't sleep and all the things you shouldn't, it'll do that again. So this uh, called brain gauge, corticometrics, this is what healthy looks like. You see all the greens? That's what it looks like after concussion. And some people heal, this person did, uh, 19 days. Many times people don't. So we can measure that. And then if we're doing, what is our treatment called? Remember three letters, T, therapeutic, lifestyle, change, TLC. If our treatment is effective, guess what? It should improve. And if it's not, we miss something. And we need to go back and figure out what we missed. Blood lab tests, really important. These are the ones that you want to be thinking about. Vitamin D, those are the levels. 65 to 100 is what I like for most people. Hemoglobin A1C, really important. It increases oxidative stress. Remember, promoting inflammation up to 5,000% when it's elevated. This is a big deal. We want clo as close to five or lower is better. Fasting insulin. If we have a high fasting insulin, that is what kind of diabetes? Type 3. High blood sugar is type 2. High insulin is type 3. And often there, there's linkages. CRP is a measure for inflammation. We like it less than 0.5. I have patients that start at a 12. Their whole body and brain are on fire. Homocysteine, less than 7. As it goes above 7, the brain begins to shrink. Homocysteine is strongly linked with brain degeneration and brain shrinking. Another blood test, and this is one of the newest ones available. I love this one. We're measuring 40 different antibodies in the blood to things affecting the brain. So we're looking at demyelinization. Anybody know what that disease is? MS. You can see it 10, 15 years early sometimes. Blood-brain barrier disruption. Leaky gut, this is leaky brain. Neuromuscular, brain autoimmunity. So what's an autoimmune disease that we can think of? Arthritis, Arthur, right? Our immune system is attacking us. Lupus, scleroderma. But many, dementia often has an autoimmune component to it. If we have positives here uh, in brain autoimmunity, we're going down that road. And then remember we said the I word inflammation? Look at all the markers we're measuring for brain inflammation. Now, out of 40 markers, this patient has six that are positive. 
what's significant is they have infection, two markers in infection, human herpes virus number six, and their, their seven was borderline, strongly linked with Alzheimer's, fr the frontal lobe. That virus likes to settle in the frontal lobe. And then herpes simplex virus number one, like the cold sore virus, also strongly linked with Alzheimer's. So that patient is working really hard on their lifestyle, but they're having issues because chronic infection has been going on and they didn't realize it. And that patient has a mother with Alzheimer's. Now, with effective treatment, that will go back to normal. So it's a, a wonderful test, allows us to see that. How cute is that? <laughs> so one thing that's bad for the brain is sit-itis. It's too much sitting. So let's stand. Anxiety and stress, we all know, is hard on the brain, right? Our brain follows our breathing. When we're stressed, what's our breathing like? So this kind of breathing activates the vagus nerve. It's called 448. So what we're going to do is we'll breathe in, no count of four. It's 1,001, two, breathe in, hold, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, and out to a count of eight. Keep going. Good. Do that again. Hold. Out to count of eight. Last time, breathe in. Out. Good. Go ahead and grab a seat. Who knows how to meditate? Who has a meditation practice? Yeah, good for you. Guess what? We just did a mini meditation. Meditate is a root word for medicate, and it means to be aware of. When you're aware of your breathing like that, that is meditation. And as I call it a three breath mini meditation. Sometimes I do a seven. Uh, just being aware of the breathing is awesome. So we talked about second brain, right? We have 100 billion neurons in this brain. We have 500 million neurons in the brain around the gut. Really important. In fact, the brain impacts the gut, and the gut impacts the brain. Remember the vagus nerve? It connects the two. We used to think it, the signaling went from the brain to the gut only. Now we know it goes both ways. Which is more, brain to gut or gut to brain? 90% of the signaling is from gut to brain. Your gut affects your brain powerfully. Dr. David Perlmutter was one of my mentors, and he, one of the things he taught me, he's a medical neurologist, Naples, Florida. He spends most of his time working with people with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and bipolar and the list, schizophrenia, working on this brain to help this one. In my experience, we have to work on both. And the kind of patients we see are getting more challenging. Leaky gut, this is a cross-section of the intestine, the small intestine. And what's on the inside of the intestine? That is stinky, poopy stuff that goes in the toilet. Air freshener time. You see the blood vessels? What separates stinky, poopy stuff from your bloodstream? One cell layer thick, the thickness of your eyelid. That's it. So when we make poor eating choices, if we decide to... Uh, do things that are just hard on the gut, and most of us know what they are. We damage that. Now it's called leaky gut, and we leak toxins, bacteria, undigested food particles, right into the bloodstream. What do you think that creates? Anybody want to think the I word? <laughs> Inflammation. And that inflames what? The gut and the brain. When leaky gut develops, leaky brain develops. Now, what do we know always happens after concussion? Leaky gut within 90 minutes and leaky brain within 90 minutes. And the immune system goes tilt into autoimmune attack. And so that's an important part of why concussion creates so many brain problems. So diseases linked to leaky gut. Wow, does any of that? Chronic fatigue. What about obesity? We don't think of that. Leaky gut creates that in many people. Diabetes. Cancer, heart disease, inflammation, that's the next class on gut health. What about all these drug ads for psoriasis? You notice how there's so many of them? Why? Because we have a high inflammation lifestyle. 
with a lot of people from Leaky Gut because they've been watching the Larry the Cable Guy commercial and they eat garbage and they pop the purple pill. Prilosec, that doesn't work. And then brain degeneration is very much linked to leaky gut, as is anxiety and depression. What food creates leaky gut in 100% of people tested every time, uh, and this is repeated in multiple studies around the world now? Gluten. So gliadin, which is, see gliadin, that's the water insoluble part of gluten. Gluten creates leaky gut all the time. Now, if you're 18 and you're real healthy, you eat it and you heal up again. Like you take an aspirin, you lose a teaspoon of blood and it heals until it doesn't. Maybe you turn 30, maybe increase stress, and now your health starts to go downhill and you don't realize leaky gut from what you've been eating is part of it. What did we do for Doug? We got him off his allergic foods. 80% of the people I test with blood testing are reacting to the dairy protein. And in general, it's highly inflammatory. We got him off gluten and dairy. We started the phase one 30-day supplement program. We did some brain balancing treatments. Remember the lasers we talked about? We did that to help his brain recover from concussion. We did what's called energy medicine. Did you know your cells are 100 times more sensitive to energy and frequency than chemicals? So drugs, awesome when we need them. Supplements, awesome. But energy, we're way more sensitive to energy. So that's part of healing. We set the vagal nerve. The vagus nerve runs from the brain stem down to all of our important organs. And it's referred to as the pacemaker of the brain. So what's happened now is there's now pacemakers, not for the heart, but for the brain. They implant them in the chest. They wrap it around the vagus nerve. It's about 20,000 bucks, usually not covered by insurance, and it's medically uh, now accepted. What can we do? We can learn to stimulate the vagus without having to spend 20,000. Does that sound like a plan? The vagus nerve stimulation has been shown to help with anxiety, depression, sleep problems. It can turn off a seizure, turn off migraine headaches, help with ADD, uh, epilepsy, arthritis, asthma, and it helps with inflammation because the vagus nerve activates the switch to turn down inflammation. How do we do it? Remember that breathing we just did, 448? Gargling is another one. I do it before meals, usually not at restaurants. I tried once and my wife gave me the look. She was an elementary ed teacher. <laughs> I haven't done it since. Uh, laser, remember that V-light? You can use that, you can treat it directly that way. Uh, and there's other treatments we do for that as well. Remember we did our test? You put your left hand above your head. Let's do a vagus exercise. Put your left hand up in the air and now touch your little finger and thumb together just like I'm doing. And now little finger and ring finger and work your way up and then double tap on index and work your way down. Good, now I'm gonna do it again, but each time we do it we're gonna add an ah. When you do that, you fire cranial nerve 9 and 10, lifting the soft palate. So, ah, 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 ah. Two more. Ah, 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 ah. Awesome. That is a vagal nerve stimulation exercise. We actually do that while lasering parts of the brain. And it's really powerful. Now, for fun, let's recheck. Put that same left hand above your head. Now slowly go tip to tip. Let's see how you do. Good. Anybody? Now, anybody notice improvement? Right. If you improved with that, that's a really good sign. Your brain is more plastic changeable. It's responsive. That's good. If it didn't change, if it changed some, that's good. If it didn't change at all, you need a little more work. We got to work at <laughs> Practice makes perfect, but maybe your vitamin D is low. Maybe you didn't sleep. Maybe your brain's on inflammation because of the wrong fats. We'll talk about that next. What's America's drug of choice? Our top drug problem. Sure. It creates more death, harm, suffering than any other drug. Sugar. It's a socially acceptable drug. By the way, you know, we look at sodas. And we're not drinking as many. If you drink your glass of orange juice, you have the same effect as drinking your can of Coke on blood sugar. Eat the orange, not the juice. 
The fiber is important. People tell me they do juicing. Uh, great. Throw away the juice and keep the fiber. Uh, now, reality is I do the Vitamix. I threw everything in. And so instead of juicing, I grind it up and make smoothies or soups. We need the fiber. Grain brain. The surprising truth about wheat, carbs, and sugar. Your brain's silent killers. He has over 300 references in there. That is not overstating it at all. We harm our brain when we consume sugar, but two slices of whole wheat bread have the same effect as six teaspoons of pure sugar. It goes, and gluten-free, good, because we're not firing inflammation with gluten. But gluten-free bread also has the same effect as Coca-Cola, you know, the sugar. Go easy on your bread. Somebody somewhere said, man does not live on bread alone. So you're gonna learn what's more important than bread. Do not eat diet anything. Excitotoxins. Anybody heard of excitotoxins? We, in our, and by the way, the word doctor means teacher. So we have a lending library. In our library is the book Excitotoxins, The Taste That Kills by the neurologist Russell Blaylock. These artificial sweeteners are incredibly harmful to the brain. Diet Pepsi, Diet Coke frightens me from a neurology perspective. Don't eat diet anything, diet, salad dressing, whatever. What did they do? They took out the fat, which by the way doesn't make us fat. What does make us fat? Sugar. And they put more sugar in this stuff in. The story of Splenda is it was an insecticide developed initially that tastes sweet. What it is, Splenda is a molecule of sugar and one of chlorine. Remember the skull and crossbones on the pool building? You put those together. How they got that through regulation to be approved, I have no idea. Sucralose is trouble. Splenda. Aspartame is NutraSweet. These are cytotoxins. What they do, they over-rev the cells in the brain like over-revving the engine on the car. You redlining, redline it until it gets hot and burns out. And then the cells die. These promote death of brain cells. And if you drink that once, it's not good. But this is people that do this repeatedly, ongoing. And it promotes dementia. Don't do this. What about MSG, monosodium glutamate? So one term is called chemical concussion from eating this stuff. 30 names of MSG nobody told you about. It's hidden in all sorts of processed food. Yeah, look at this, natural seasonings. What does natural mean? Well, arsenic is natural. Just because it's natural doesn't mean it's safe. Uh, it can be barley malt and malt flavoring and caramel flavoring and food seasonings and bullion and broth and stock. Read your labels. The principle is the less your food has been doctored, the less you need a doctor. Short labels. If it's a bunch of small print I can't read, I put it back in the shelf. If I can't pronounce it, put it back in the shelf. My grandmother would not understand the name, I put it back in the shelf. As I said, the less our food has been doctored. So eat color. That's not M&Ms, by the way. <laughs> eat color. What do we eat? The pyramid. What's the base of the pyramid? My grandmother in Glenella, North Dakota said in German, eat your vegetables. She was right. Meat, fowl, seafood, eggs, go organic. Uh, in, in terms of your organic food dollars, focus them on right here because meat concentrates toxins. And for fish, do wild caught because farm-raised fish is fed what? Soybeans and corn and uh, treated with Roundup? Yes, bad stuff. Yes, thank you. Healthy fats, the brain is the fattest organ in the body at about 60%. We need healthy fats. Nuts and seeds, what are some examples of healthy nuts and seeds? Pecans, Brazil, almonds, what about chia seeds? Chia seeds. Yeah, chia seeds, what about hemp seed? What about flax seeds? Those are also really good ones. And then oils, we've been told animal fat is bad. We've been told red meat is bad. Grass-fed beef is a health food. It's high in the EPA, DHA, like fish oil, from grass. Corn-fed beef from a feedlot is terrible. Where's fruit? Is that the biggest part or the smallest part? Smallest. We sometimes, we are fruitaholics. And fruit is fructose, fruit sugar, and that feeds inflammation if it's too much. So keep it small, eat more vegetables and fruit. 
And then if you're going to eat fruit, what's, which fruits are the most brain healthy? Berries. 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 What kind of berries? Wild blueberries are a superfood. Now, if you are going to eat strawberries, make sure they're organic because they tend to be they're in the top 10 high pesticides. Berries are the best. Anybody heard of our fatty acid balance? One of the most important reasons why we have an epidemic of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, vascular dementia, Lewy body, and the list. Why neurodegeneration? The ratio of omega-6 to omega-3, and we're going to talk about those, but the omega-6 would be like corn oil, soybean oil, cottonseed oil, uh, and sunflower oil are the worst of them. They're in our cheap vegetable oils. The ratio of those to omega-3s, what are those? They come from grass, like grass-fed beef. They come from fish, EPA, DHA. The ratio for prehistoric humans was about 1 to 1. By the turn of the century, in 1900, it was 4 to 1. We had more risk for inflammation. That's not good. 400% worse. What is it now? 25 to 1. Is it a reason why everybody's on fire with inflammation? Chronic disease is rampant. Neurodegeneration is rampant. This is a big deal. Our vegetable oil went from two pounds per year in 1909. We're 25 pounds a year of the wrong oils. Do you think that makes a difference? So the oils that get us in trouble are right here. Peanut, I, I don't like for other reasons, and canola has its own problems. When you get the slides, you'll see sunflower is the worst of it. Corn, soybean are really bad, and so is cottonseed. The high blue is the ones we want to avoid.